Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Larry Holder. I'm a professor in the School of Electrical Engineering, Computer Science, uh, more on the computer science side. I also run the Smart Environments REU program. You see several of you here. And problems are in. This is sharing the screen. This was a little So, if you want, perfect. Back. <laughs> so, um, I guess what I'm going to talk about today is kind of my road to research. Uh, how, how did I get to where I am, and uh, what were the influences along the way, and what's it like to be a professor? And if any of you might think you want to go into academia at some point, uh, hopefully, I can give you some insights as to how to do that. So, one of the themes that throughout my life has been uh, AI that appears in movies. And so I'm going to talk about a lot of different movies that uh, have influenced me over my life. Um, so the very first AI movie I, I ever saw was called Colossus the Forbid Project. And I don't know if any of you have ever seen that, but it's an awesome movie. Um, and it, uh, it exemplifies the mistake that AI movies make over and over again, and that is they come up with this super AI system, they give it control over their entire nuclear arsenal, and then they, you know, say, what could possibly go wrong? And of course, uh, something always goes wrong. So, so uh, Colossus eventually decides that uh, it needs to keep humans um, kind of under control, because if you let them out of control, they do bad things. And so he calls himself world control. And so if you want to catch a clip of that, uh, you can see that. I'll show you a few clips, but I got, I don't know, like 50 movies in here, so I can't show them all. So um, I grew up in Illinois, um, near, near St. Louis, right across the Mississippi River from St. Louis, in a town called Granite City. Went to high school in 78, 82. Uh, another great movie that came out, well, it wasn't a particularly great movie, but for AI people, it was a great movie, and that was the first uh, Star Trek motion picture. Uh, of course, uh, you know, if you're in computer science or engineering in general, you're probably a Trekkie, and so having that first movie, the first full-length Star Trek movie come out was pretty awesome. And of course, the movie was, was focused on the Voyager space probe that evidently, eventually, found its way to some planet where they realized that its goal in life was to learn all that was learnable. So they built this gigantic spaceship so it could learn all that was learnable. And then it uh, went back to Earth looking for its creator so it could give its creator that, all of that knowledge. So. So those are a couple of movies I really enjoyed and had a big influence on me and I went to go. So obviously at that point I really wanted to go into computers and uh, like most families I guess back then, you know, the parents would buy their kids a computer. Um, this was my first computer, that's a picture of it, that's called an Apple IIe. Uh, did anybody ever program on an Apple IIe? No. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we used to have one in the lab. Okay. How about a uh, Commodore 64? Anybody go back that far? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Then there's the uh, Atari and the TI 99 4A or something like that. So those were all kind of the first computers. Um, so like, like all you know, success stories in computers. What does everybody do with a computer? Well, they write a program and they want to you know, make a billion dollars the next Facebook, all that kind of stuff. So I wrote a program, and it was a pretty cool program. It would estimate the price of a stock. You feed in a bunch of information. Uh, of course, there wasn't a lot of programming languages back there, so I wound up writing most of it in a similar language, which is a horrific experience. But uh, there's also BASIC, which was a little bit better, but you can't do a lot with BASIC. So I, I came up with a super duper program, actually packaged it up you know, for sale and, and put it out for sale, and I sold four copies. So that was my entrepreneurial experience. Uh, didn't quite lead to the billion dollar company, but uh, I gave it a shot. So. It's more than zero. <laughs> more than zero. So. Um, so at that point, well, I don't know if I kind of chucked it and said I should go to school instead, but you know, 
I you know, wanted to go to college to learn about computers anyway, so I put my entrepreneurial uh, goals on hold for a while. So uh, off to college, uh, I went to the University of Illinois in Urbana Champaign. And my bachelor's was in computer engineering because I really wanted to know how computers work. I didn't really understand how they worked. And so uh, that's you know, pretty much what I learned um, as an undergrad was how computers work. And uh, all the way down to the microcode that's inside the computer. And I always wondered, you know, when you plug the computer in, how does it know what to do? You know, it's just a hunk of metal and you plug it in and somehow it comes to life. And so I finally saw how that worked and that was uh, really impressive, but at that point, you know, it's kind of, okay, I got it. Now let's make this computer do some interesting things. And so uh, that's when I took my first AI course and I was hooked at that point thinking, you know, this, this is what I want to help computers do to get smarter. And of course, uh, lots of cool AI movies came out, uh, War Games and the uh, Whopper program that uh, they eventually taught it that nuclear war wasn't a, nobody wins nuclear war. And so I tried all these scenarios, a really dramatic scene in the movie. And at the very end, it says, you know, strange game, the only winning move is not to play. And they, Matthew Broderick saves the world. Uh, and of course, the consummate AI movie Terminator came out in 84. Um, and, uh, you know, it was an instant hit, especially with computer science AI people. Uh, if you've never watched that, I would recommend you watch it and specifically watch the little uh, messages that come up when they show the Terminator's view. You see, you see things that are really bizarre. Some of them are kind of comedic, but, but cool movie. Okay, so uh, I guess uh, one thing I learned, so you know, it's a lesson for you. When I was a senior, I, I realized I, I wanted to go into research. I wanted to go into grad school. And so um, I went to the professors, the AI professors, and I basically went through them one at a time. And I said, hey, I'm interested in AI. I want to do a project with you. I'll work for free. You know, just give me something to do. And the first guy I talked to, uh, world famous AI professor, he basically said, no, uh, you're not good enough or something. I don't know why. So I went to the kind of number two AI professor, and he, he said, sure, I'll give you a project. And he basically gave me a, a machine learning piece of software that was uh, written in Pascal, and he wanted me to, to translate it or port it to Lisp, two languages you most of you probably never seen before. But, uh, but you know, I got in the door. Eventually, uh, I worked for that professor on my research. and. Uh, so I guess my, my point is that I would recommend that you be bold. And if you have an area you're interested in, you think you might go into research, knock on a professor's door and say, hey, I want to do a project. I want to get a paper published with you, and I'll work for free. And chances are they'll do it because they like free, free labor. So uh, that was my conclusion. I really liked AI and uh, finally found a professor who would give me a project. So then I went into uh, my master's. So I switched to computer science, went into master's, uh, also at Illinois. And it was in machine, machine learning. And mo most of you, when you start out doing research, you probably think, ah, you know, I, I, you know I've got nine weeks in the summer. I could probably write the, uh, you know, the next uh, AI system. How hard can it be? Well, it turns out that's really hard. And, and uh, you know, back then, anyway, back, so this was you know, 20 years ago. We didn't have the fast computers, the, the tools that we have today. But uh, so my master's uh, thesis was to uh, look at essentially social networks and graphs and try to find patterns. Of them. And uh, I've been doing that ever since, actually. So, uh, so then I went on for a PhD. I tried machine learning again, and it was still hard. Um, and I guess the one of the morals I learned from doing a PhD is that most people, when they start out with a PhD, they think, um, I'm going to change the world. I'm going to do a breakthrough. You know, I'm going to solve AI or, or you know, world peace, world hunger. And when you're all done, you wind up making just a tiny little increment in some obscure piece of knowledge that you know, your, your professor or your advisor eventually whittles you down to a really small problem when you make a, uh, a 
contribution there. And so my, my lesson there, which I, you know, I, I hope most PhD advisors, um, you know, the way they think is that a PhD isn't about a breakthrough. A PhD is training to do research. So when you're done with a PhD, you should be ready to do the research that will lead to a breakthrough. But the PhD is not the time to do a breakthrough. That's the question. Yeah. So if you're going to do a PhD, so what if you want to do, um, so you said always little incremental stuff, right? Because that's how like any day to day is always little incremental. But uh, if you want a bigger purpose, you can like, because PhD is a lot of your choice, right? Or to some extent you can choose. So you ask your advisor for help. So to some extent you can choose like a small part but it fits in your, like your bigger picture. Yeah, definitely. I mean, most, most parts. So actually, one side note to your comment, you can work on what you want. Most professors, their goal in life is to get funding. You know? <laughs> and yeah. once they get that funding, then they have very specific deliverables, especially if you like to do Department of Defense. You know, they've got these specific deliverables that you have to provide. And so they're going to, if you want funding, then they're going to have your PhD contribute <coughs> to that goal. But you're right. You know, it, another good thing to look for in a professor is if they've got a big project going on where there's lots of students contributing. Um, because then, you know, two things happen. One is you're affiliated with that project, and if it turns out to be a big breakthrough, then your name's associated with it. And plus, um, the, the main thing you want to do as a PhD student is publish, publish papers. And the more people you have working on things, I mean, as much as I hate to see papers that have like eight or ten authors because they basically throw everybody in the group on the paper whenever they publish anything, but at the end of the day, when you come out and you say, well, I've got you know, 20 publications, one's in science, one's in nature, and, and they're your publications, even though you're one of you know, 1,000 authors on that paper, it's you know, still a contribution. So, so yes, um, you know, while your piece may be small, it's always nice if you can plug into a bigger project. Uh, so while I was doing this, uh, not a whole lot of AI movies came out while I was doing my PhD, but of course the sequel to Terminator came out where we found out that his, his uh, brain is actually a neural network. And uh, at least in this movie, when they send out the Terminator, they can't learn. And so they reset his processor so he can learn and then he starts uh, learning cool things, uh, specifically learning, you know, value of human life things for killer robots to learn. So. Okay, so uh, I got my PhD in 1991, uh, and then from there I was off to University of Texas at Arlington. That's uh, one of two offers I had. I had an offer to go to Mark Marietta in Colorado. Um, it was an industry position. They did a lot of uh, de Department of Defense work, but you know, when you go into industry, uh, you're a little bit more constrained about what you work on. You know, people tell you what to work on. It's usually, you know, a piece of a product that will ultimately be sold to make the company money. Whereas in the university, you know, you pretty much work on whatever you want. Now, you know, they want you to publish and they want you to get grant money. So you got to work on stuff that somebody likes. But um, by and large, you can pursue whatever you want. So uh, I was at University of Texas Arlington for 15 years, went through the whole tenure process. So for those of you who don't know, an assistant professor does not have tenure. And after about five years, uh, you go up for tenure. And if the university feels that you've done a good enough job and they think you're going to keep doing a good job, then you become an associate professor. So at that point, you have tenure, which essentially means they can't fire you. Um, but uh, there's still more accolades to go. And so in, in about another five years, you can go up for full professor. And the main difference between associate and full, the way I understand it, is that you have a global impact. So uh, the main thing you, you want to do is you want to be able to find some you know, really famous people. Like, you know, can I get a reference letter from Bill, Bill Gates or you know, uh, Elon Musk saying, Larry Holder is awesome. You should you know, definitely make him a full professor. So. Uh, I didn't get letters from either of those two people, but I got letters from a few people that are well known in computer science. So hopefully I've had an impact. Uh, another big thing that happened to me while I was uh, at the University of Texas is I got married to Diane Cook, who's also a professor here in computer science. 
And so um, we just celebrated our 27th anniversary. So uh, even though you might marry somebody who's a fellow computer scientist or a fellow colleague in whatever area you're in, you can still survive, <laughs> even though your uh, you know, conversations at the dinner table are, are pretty much about computer science all day long. But, but that's OK, because we both love to do it. Um, so what did I do at Texas? Um, my main research, of course, is in AI, uh, machine learning. And as I mentioned, I focus a lot on graphs or networks and trying to find in interesting patterns, extract knowledge from them, and so forth. And I'll say more about that a little later. Uh, but um, this time, uh, I think AI was starting to become a little bit more popular in the mainstream. And so a lot of movies started coming out. Um, so these are just uh, some of the movies I think are, are really good. I, I put these movies in here because I, I think they really just they, they touch on some important concepts in AI, and they really do a good job of, of you know, showing what AI can do, you know, maybe just a little bit past uh, you know, 10, 20 years into the future. There's lots of movies that have robots and you know, people who look like robots and robots who look like people, but uh, they aren't necessarily really inspiring kind of movies. So, so anyway, um, Bicentennial Man is about a robot that tries to become human, and he actually you know, tries to convince uh, Congress, essentially, which is a world Congress at that time, that he's a human being. And so the question is, you know, what's the difference between a human and a robot as, as that line starts to blur? Of course, the Matrix, we may all actually be living in the Matrix. We don't know. Um, but it was built by an AI system to turn us into batteries. If you haven't seen the Matrix, it's essentially it. First, uh, the movie AI came out in 2001. Not my favorite AI movie, but uh, of course it has the right title, so maybe they'll make a sequel. Uh, and of course, Matrix was very popular, um, so they made a couple of sequels. And uh, yet another Terminator movie, Terminator 3. And probably my favorite AI movie of all time, iRobot, came out in 2004. Um, and, uh, this is really good because it really touched on all of the major issues in AI. You know, what is AI? What's intelligence? What's the difference between a human and a machine? Should machines have rights? If a machine kills somebody, did they commit murder? Or is it the programmers or designers that committed murder? What, is it even a murder? Um, but there's one specific aspect that iRobot uh, touched on. I'm going to try and show the clip here. So where is everybody? This facility was designed, built, and is operated mechanically. No significant human presence from inception to production. So robots building robots. Authorization code, please. Well, that's just stupid. Okay, well, the volume wasn't great. Uh, now, what um, Will Smith says there is um, they go to this plant where they're building all these robots, and it's completely automated. And he says, you know, robots building robots, that's just stupid. And, you know, not a particularly intellectual line, but it uh, exemplifies one of the you know, things that I think a lot about AI, and that's the fact that the, one of the biggest differences between machines and humans is that machines can replicate themselves almost instantaneously and in parallel. So if we ever, say, had a robot that was doing bad things, um, we can't necessarily just pull the plug on it because it might have already copied itself you know, thousands of times. Or you know, it may not be a robot, it may be a piece of software that's sitting on a machine that you know, somebody's designed thinking it's gonna do good things, but it turns out doing bad things. Um, but that's one of the big differences is that, you know, an AI system can essentially replicate itself exactly uh, ad infinitum. So 
just something to keep in mind when you're if you, if you ever work on AI is that uh, you, you have to realize that you know we're getting to the point where AI is controlling a lot of things making some value judgments and um, we want to make sure that that's under control I guess so that's what I'm saying but again great AI movie definitely recommend that one okay so uh, in 2006 um, my wife Diane and I were recruited to come to here to WSU and so I came to WSU of course I was still a full professor so back in 2006 and I've been here ever since and uh, of course my research is still pretty much the same I, I tacked on the, the word smart environments mainly because smart environments is kind of an application for um, a lot of the AI and machine learning uh, research that we do and I'll say more about that a little later um, as I mentioned one of the major things that they want professors to do is to bring in money and so not to boast but just to give you my number I've brought in 14 million dollars to WSU so far so um, that's pretty good <laughs> uh, and publications uh, I have about 230 publications uh, career I think about 150 or so since I came to WSU and uh, that brings me to kind of the another big point I want to make so whether you're you know doing research you um, you know whether it's undergrad grad you want to get into academia publications are the currency of and even if you want to go to industry and do research, most industry research labs, you know, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, they want to know what papers do you have and where did you publish them. So uh, a good place to go to find out, if, you know, if people are any good is Google Scholar. So I'll show you page on Google Scholar Okay, so Google, Google Scholar, of course, tries to collect all scholarly information in the world. And so you can go to my Google Scholar page and see all of my great stuff. Um, but if you want to ever go into academia, the probably the number one thing that they're going to look at is this number right here. This is your H index. See so my H index is 35. And so what does that mean? That means that I have 35 papers, each of which that's been cited 35 times. So, if, and it means if I go to 30, I don't have a 36th paper that's cited 36 times. So it's basically the, the largest number of papers you can find that you've published that have been cited that many times. Um, it, it turns out that that number is very highly correlated with success in academia, so it's a, a big number that everybody tries to optimize. Uh, so, you know, mine's 35, and it's uh, here's all the citations I've had over the lifetime, 6,200 or so. Uh, I-10 index is how many papers do I have that have at least 10 citations, so 102 of my papers have at least 10, 10 times I mean. Let's go look at my life. Her H index is 68, like about twice mine. Uh, she has about, about 22,000 citations. Her I-10 index is, they're all off the chart. So she's a she's a rock star here, you know. So if you uh, want to go say hi to her, she can give you some more insights on how to do research because she does it really well. I don't know how much money she has, probably 50 million or something. I, I lost track. <laughs> So anyway, uh, this is Google Scholar. Um, you know, you probably have a page if you've ever published a paper before. 
you should definitely create one. And again, if you want to get into research, this H index is a, a big number to try to optimize. I'm looking at mine. <laughs> I'm hanging in there. Should we bring yours up? Or? If you like. <laughs> That's okay. I'm sure. It's so, uh, So, uh, so since I've been here at WSU, there's been, of course, lots of more great AI movies. Um, again, one of my favorites, Iron Man. Uh, not a ton of AI, of course, Jarvis is the big AI system in Iron Man. Uh, but uh, mostly it's, uh, you know, Avenger action stuff. So uh, another Terminator movie. Of course, there's a new one coming out. Have you seen the new Terminator movies? To come out dark date. Um, so Prometheus is uh, like the prequel to Alien, if you or Aliens, um, with uh, you know has a robot in there to basically explore humanity. Some in that one. Uh, another, well, another Iron Man three. That's <laughs> so another popular movie. Uh, the Machine, kind of an obscure movie. If you ever heard of the Turing Turing uh, test, uh, the Machine really focuses on the Turing test. Again, what does it mean to be human versus machine? And a really kind of weird movie uh, called Her, which is about um, like essentially uh, you know people start getting um, essentially you know virtual uh, companions that they talk to just uh, over audio. And of course, this guy falls in love with his virtual companion. And near the end of the movie, uh, she starts talking about instead of saying you, you, I, I, she starts saying we, we, we. And he's like, who's who's this we? And uh, so he asked her, um, says, you know, so are you in love with anybody else? And she says, yes, I'm in love with 641 people. So, uh, you know, it's just kind of a shock that the guy can't quite understand how you know somebody he loves loves him plus 640 other people. So, so it's a really interesting process to think about how an AI system relates to humans and the fact that it can essentially relate to all of us in parallel and you know how we feel about that. Uh, let's see, more AI movies, Transcendence, uh, Ex Machina, uh, Avengers, Age of Ultron, so um, I'm going to show you a clip from Age of Ultron. So this is another, uh, you know, hitting home this point about AI being kind of more prolific than you think. Uh, let me just show the clip real quick. This is Ultron. I'm glad you asked that because I wanted to take this time to explain my evil plan. It's time for some mind games. This is going very well. Uh, the, the vibranium's getting away. And you're not going anywhere. Of course not. I'm already there. You'll catch on. But first, you might need to catch Dr. Banner. So, uh, you see the quote I have here. You know, most humans think, you know, we can kind of corner AI and once we, you know, destroy it and then that's gone. But as Ultron pointed out, you know, he's already everywhere. You know, every one of those robots, the, you know, the one that said, boy, things are going, going swell. Um, 
is Ultron also. You know, so you know, how do you fight uh, an enemy that is everywhere and you know identi identical everywhere you go? So, so yeah, just you know, I like AI movies. They make me think about you know the bigger implications of what I work on. But there are more AI movies. Uh, these are some more recent ones. Um, pretty obscure, maybe you've seen them. Uh, and of course, uh, there's TV shows too. Person of Interest, my favorite TV show. Uh, you should watch that if you're interested in AI. Of course, Westworld, and uh, there's this uh, series called Black Mirror on Netflix that talks a lot about AI and its implications for the future. Um, so that's all of the AI movies that I have in my presentation. Does anybody have any AI movies that I missed? I'm always looking for new stuff. So. Last year uh, is when... It's, there's a, a season one, episode 10, I happen to know this because we look it up, of uh, X-Files has an, a smart building that uh, okay. it's business put together and they're there to investigate murders and it turns out it's just the AI in the building trying uh, to protect the company. Okay. Did you include Deuce Ex Machina? Mm -hmm. No. Um, I mean, that's an anime one, right? No, no I, I might have said it wrong, but uh, the movie that's called like something like Deuce Ex Machina. Deuce Ex Machina. Oh, it's just Ex Machina. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, that's one. Uh, Ghost in the Shell. Yeah, I, I've seen that one. I, I haven't. Uh, I didn't put it on the list. I don't know. Is the animated one better than the? <laughs> so yeah, there's there's lots of movies that didn't make my list. But, uh... Okay, so um, okay, so uh, so now that's, so that was my road to research. I, I hopefully uh, impressed on you that you know the. Movies have had a big impact on me. You know, movies are great for, you know, especially science fiction, of looking ahead of what science might be like and motivating us to try to make it happen. But what do I actually do? What, what, what does my research actually do? So let me talk about that a little bit. I won't, won't spend too much time, so I don't bore you too much. But, um, but probably my main research area is in graph mining or network mining. It's also called graph analytics, network analytics, social network analysis. Uh, anything where you're representing you know, entities and relationships between them, uh, you can build a graph. Um, and so the main thing that we're trying to do is extract knowledge from that graph. So let me look or show you a couple of graphs. So uh, one big graph uh, is the Facebook social network. And one of the big problems you deal with in graphs is that they're really big. In fact, they may be so big you can't fit them into a computer, or maybe not even on a better computer. So, for example, the Facebook um, uh, you know, estimate of Facebook users, about 2 billion. So this graph would have 2 billion nodes in it. Uh, if you just look at friendship links, uh, that would be 300 billion. So on average, what, about 150 per, per user. And uh, this graph changes a lot over time. So about 400 new users per minute uh, sign on to Facebook, and about a million uh, new friend requests per minute. So what would you want to do with a graph like this? Well, the, one of the main things you want to do with a graph, uh, like a social network, is you want to identify people that are of interest to you, uh, and then look and see if there are other people like that in the network. So say you want to sell somebody you know, a pair of socks. And so you search through Facebook and you try to find all the people that have purchased that pair of socks before. And you know, say there's 100 of them. And you try to learn something about them. What is it about them? What's common among these 100 people who all bought your pair of socks? And so you, you come up with some sort of you know, pattern or subgraph, if you will. And then you go and look for it in the rest of the big giant Facebook graph. And if you can find some matches to it, those might be people who are going to buy, you, buy your socks. And so you send them a targeted advertisement saying, hey, you know, would you like to buy this pair of socks? Um, you might even want to say, because you know, people like you buy them or something like that. 
kind of like you know, on Amazon when you you know bring up a product, it'll say people who bought this also bought these, and you might want them too. So that's a pretty common uh, task you want to do on a network. Uh, a little bit more on the security defense side. This could be a social network of everybody who lives in some foreign country, and you've identified a bunch of people that are bad, and you're looking for more people that are bad. You can do the same thing. You take all those people that are bad, you try to find a common pattern among them, look for that pattern elsewhere in the network, and that might tell you where other bad people are. So. <clears throat> for better or worse things. Um, another graph that's probably at the cutting edge of you know, the biggest graphs we have is a graph that represents the human brain, or you know, even, say, a mouse brain is hard enough. But in human brain, you've got 100 billion neurons, so those are kind of our nodes in the graph. You have 100 trillion synapses, so those are connections between the neurons, so those are the links in the graph. And each of those neurons fires about 100 times per second. Um, so, you know, I don't know what that is, you know, total firings per second, 10 trillion or so. And we just, you know, we can't represent this graph. Uh, I mean, we, we have a hard enough time trying to co collect it. We can't do it on humans for two reasons. One, it's too hard, and two, humans generally don't like you to stick probes into their brain. But, uh, you know, they can't do it on smaller organisms. I think the, the biggest organism that they have mapped the entire brain of is the uh, honeybee. I think it has about 30,000 neurons in it. And they've completely mapped it, all the connections. They can watch it firing in real time, and they can see how it reacts to different things. You, know, you put it next to a flower versus a rock, you can see how it reacts in different ways. Um, and so uh, that's a that's an interesting graph. Um, it's also a very dynamic graph, changes a lot over time. Uh, of course, as you may know, for humans, our neural network gets smaller and smaller. I think once you reach age four, that's your, the biggest your brain gets, and then it starts declining at that point. So sad news, but that's, that's life right now. So. so there's some examples of some real world networks that we would really like to analyze to find patterns. Of course, in the brain network, you're looking for uh, patterns of disease, like say, you know, here's all the brains of people who have Alzheimer's and here's people who don't. What's the difference? You know, can we isolate parts of the brain that cause Alzheimer's? <clears throat> so, a lot of interesting problems. So, uh, more abstractly, uh, how do we do this? So, uh, here's a graph, uh, a simple graph, and the idea is that it's, it's kind of streaming in over time. So, you can think of, say, the nodes as people, the edges are relationships. New people join our network. New relationships are, are made. But we want to try to find a pattern in this graph. So can anybody find a pattern? So a pattern is kind of a subgraph that repeats throughout the graph. A lot of triangles and I think I heard triangle. That's, that's one of them. That's, that's good. So one, so two of the patterns that are in here, I'll show them. Um, one is the triangle, that this red, green, purple, pink triangle, and then essentially the triangle with an extra red node attached to it. And so you can see that there are several instances of that subgraph in this graph. And so that's one of the big things we're after in a graph. Can we find these, these sub-patterns that occur a lot in this graph? And the other thing we're interested in is anomalies. So you might have noticed a close match to this pattern up here at the top. It has the triangle, but instead of having a red node hanging off of it, it has a blue node. So, so we would call that an anomaly, and it's, an, it's, it's different than an outlier. So an outlier might be if I had a, you know, I don't know, a yellow node sitting out by itself somewhere. That would be an outlier. But an anomaly is basically some, I mean, one way to look at it is it's somebody who's trying to hide in your network. And so everybody in the network has this triangle pattern, say it's how they email people or communicate. But this one person um, doesn't quite follow the pattern. They're talking to another blue person instead of a red person. And so 
you know, that could be interesting from a lot of different perspectives. You know, why, why is that person doing it? Why is it different from everybody else? Um, you know, especially if you're looking for, you know, intruders, you know, fraudsters, um, spam bots, whatever, you know, in your network. Um, you're very interested in anomalies that specifically look close to normal patterns but are different slightly. So those are the main things we do. That's, that's kind of one of the main things in my research is to try to do this, find these patterns and anomalies in graphs. The graphs are changing over time. The graphs are getting bigger and bigger. Um, you know, we can't fit them all into a computer, so we have to kind of stream them in over time. How do we do all that? Uh, so one question you might have is, well, why that pattern? There's some other patterns that repeat in there. Or, or which one's better? Is it the triangle or the triangle plus the extra edge? And the, the main uh, metric or, or heuristic we use to find these patterns is one of compression. And so it's, it's for, real simple. Um, if I take all the instances of this pattern here, so all these things in yellow, and I remove them and I replace them by a new node, call it a, uh, and I'll give it a different color, like uh, white. So we put white node in there, and that white node represents this pattern. What happens to the graph? The graph gets smaller. Because we, for each one of these, we remove uh, four nodes and four edges and replace it by a single node. So the graph gets smaller, or it's compressed. And so basically what we're after here is which pattern will compress the graph the most if we remove all the instances of that pattern and replace it by a single node. So that's a really hard problem, NP-complete, if you know what that means, which basically means you can't solve it you know, in less than a century. So we throw a lot of heuristics at it and so forth. Uh, but it turns out that if you can find the pattern that maximally compresses the graph, that is a very interesting pattern in a lot of domains. OK, so that's graph mining. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is um, the smart environment, since that's what my REU program is about. And if you uh, were at the orientation for our program, you've seen these slides already, so bear with me on these. But what is a smart environment? A smart environment is an environment where you deploy sensors and you collect data from those sensors, you learn patterns, and you take action in the environment. And so specifically, the environment has something you want to optimize, like say it's uh, your home, you want to keep it the temperature comfortable, but you also want to minimize your energy bill. So you unleash a smart environment on your home, you, know, you deploy sensors, you know, probably temperature sensors in different rooms. Uh, the system watches over time how you use your home and you know, when you need temperatures to be at certain levels. And then it will essentially reprogram your thermostat or uh, you know, do other things in your home if you can do it. Open, close windows, blinds. Uh, if you have zoned heating and cooling, it can mess with the zones. And so that's the action it takes. It sees if that improves things. You know, you're, you're still comfortable, but your energy bill goes down. And it just keeps doing that over and over again, trying to optimize whatever performance metric you give it. And we've done this. In a lot of different contexts, uh, we, you know, obviously agriculture is a big deal here at WSU, and so they have a smart farm that does this. Uh, Spokane, had, well, Pullman is kind of a smart city. All of the electrical, every house has a smart meter on it that collects electrical information, and that's all consolidated at our power company, and they do this kind of thing. From to the building level, you know, we talked about the home, and even on your body or inside your body, uh, you may have sensors on your body or inside your body, and you want to optimize some factor of your your performance. And so, so that's what smart environments are designed to do: is to, to deploy sensors, collect data, learn from that data, and then take action to try to optimize some performance. And um, there is actually uh, sort of commercial products that have come out of this. One is the Smart Home in a Box uh, that you can sign up to get a free one if you want. The only uh, caveat is that you have to agree to send your data back to us so that we can analyze it. Uh, but it's mostly a bunch of motion sensors that you put in your house and a computer that collects that data and sends it back. Um, 
And there's also a mobile app called Activity Learning or OWL uh, that you can download. I, I think it's on Android as well, but definitely on the uh, Apple App Store. And uh, so way back to my first slide, I think, when I talked about my experience trying to sell a piece of software, didn't go so well. Um, I have another company called Adaptelligence right now, and at Adaptelligence, the, the goal is to take this smart home technology that we're developing here at WSU and move it into the commercial sector. So we basically took this activity learning app that you know, uses the sensors on your phone to try to figure out what you're doing. You know, are you cooking, cleaning, watching TV? And basically just spit it up with a lot of cool graphics. And, um, and I think last time I looked, we had like 110 users for this app. So better than four, although this is free, so I'm not making any money off of it. But, uh, 110 is better than four, so maybe it'll lead to uh, better things. So you know, ultimately what we want to do with this is we want to uh, use it for elderly people that are, are living alone in their homes, and you have a, a remote caregiver, say a family member or you know an actual nurse, and they want to be able to look at what the person is doing, see you know whether they're you know, staying active, they're following their usual routine, or perhaps there's an anomaly and they should intervene with a phone call, a visit, uh, you know, emergency services and so forth. So that's a little bit of my research, what I do here. So last few slides, I just want to talk about uh, what's next for smart environments and AI in general. I know not all of you are even in computer science, but you're probably going to hear a lot about AI if you haven't already. Of course, there's lots of cool movies about AI I haven't talked about. This isn't a very good movie, but it's a Disney movie if you want to get an idea of how annoying it might be to live in, in a smart house. But um, so basically, we're trying to trans, transition from smart environments, which are you know just kind of monitoring you and trying to make sure everything's OK to more a concept of enhanced living. So, you know, even if you're, you know, not elderly and you don't have any sort of health issues, you're 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 healthy and you just want to improve at something. Uh, you want to get stronger, faster, lose weight, gain weight, whatever. Um, you know, can we use the same smart environment concept to optimize your goals? <clears throat> Um, so obviously, you know, everybody wants to sustain their health. Most people want to live longer. So can we increase your longevity using this process? Or if you're more interested in, you know, productivity, can we increase that? You know, can the smart environment help you increase productivity as being kind of a passive uh, assistant? Uh, one of the big issues with making this happen is deploying a bunch of sensors in your home. And most people don't like that. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, we've deployed a lot of these these smart smart home in a box to people's homes that aren't you know are somewhat cognitively impaired. And so, you know, one day we come in and we explain to them, you know, we're putting motion detectors in your ceiling and we're putting this computer in your closet, and it's to help you. Okay. The next day they wake up, they see this motion detector in the ceiling. They have no idea what it is. They don't know where it came from. What do they do? They pull it off. They throw it in the trash. They go to the closet. They see this computer. Never seen it before. They pull the plug on it. So, <laughs> um, so you know, the, there's a lot of challenges, especially with cognitively impaired people, uh, to deploy this kind of technology. So. You know, there, so obviously we need sense, a lot more sensors to do a good job of it, but we also want uh, you know to address privacy issues because you know data leaving your home, who knows who's looking at it. If you have things in your house that a computer can control, well, humans can break in and control that too. Um, so a lot, you know, everybody wants wants smart environments in their house, but they want to make sure it's safe, and that's always a challenge. Of course, um, you know, eventually we'll have robots in our homes. If you don't already, you, know, you might have a, a Roomba, Roomba vacuuming your floor. 
Um, but obviously we'd like to have more general purpose robots that can do lots of everyday tasks. You know, not only can they vacuum your floor, but they can also do your laundry and cook your meals. Um, and, uh, you know, we're getting there. You know, robots are doing impressive things, but we're still not ready to put one in everybody's home. And at the heart of uh, all of this, I think, you know, mainly because I do research in this area, um, you know, all of these things need machine learning because every environment is different, everybody's goals are different, and the, the system needs to adapt. So that's a nice picture of what, what uh, good things are coming, uh, but we also need to ask what, what could go wrong <laughs> if we just kind of, you know, push ahead and, and deploy AI in, in our homes, you know, it seems like it's gonna work well. A lot of people are concerned about that. So I'll throw up a few quotes from people you may know. Uh, back in 2014, Stephen Hawking said, AI could spell the end of the human race. Uh, Bill Gates, I'm in the camp that's concerned about superintelligence. Uh, Eric Schmidt from Google, um, on the positive side, AI will be one of the greatest forces for good in mankind's history. Elon Musk, AI is a fundamental risk to the existence of human civilization. And most recently, Henry Kissinger, who hopefully you all know as Secretary of State back in the Nixon presidency. Um, I didn't even know he was looking at this stuff, but he wrote this big long article for Forbes talking about AI, and he basically was concerned because he said, you know, we're, we're moving towards a world that relies on machines that are ungoverned by any ethical or philosophical norms. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, do you see a path to super intelligence, like, uh, like uh, what, what subfield of AI could possibly lead to super intelligence? Um, I, I guess I'll say yes, and I, to, to me, the, the path to super intelligence is reverse engineering the human brain, because that's, the brain is the only biological example, well, it's the only example we have of super intelligence on the planet, if you want to call it super intelligence. Um, but even if you're going to reverse engineer the brain, that means you're going to create a computer model of it. And then the question is, how do you model the brain in a computer? Most people would probably say deep learning neural networks is the solution there. But, um, anyway, that's my thought and a good lead into the next slide, which is uh, what's next for AI. So uh, a lot of you have probably heard of deep learning. Uh, you, you might have seen um, you know, stuff from DeepMind, which is kind of Google's deep learning company, um, beating humans at all of these video games, you know, from arcade games. Now they're actually doing uh, first-person shooter games and strategy games, of course, chess and checkers, and uh, more recently, Go. Uh, essentially, machines are now the best players on the planet. Um, but so deep learning, uh, I guess real quick, deep learning is a neural network. Neural networks are designed to model the, the neuron network in your brain. Um, 30, 40 years ago when neural networks were first invented, computers were weak and they really couldn't build very big networks and so they didn't really do very well. Um, but in the last 10 years or so, since computers have gotten a lot faster, they can put much bigger networks. That's why it's deep. It's got a lot of layers in this network, a lot of nodes in each of its layers. Uh, and it turns out they can actually learn really impressive stuff. You know, the, you know, the uh, image recognition, speech recognition, natural language understanding, you're talking to Siri, you're talking to, um, what's Google's Android's assistant? Google. Is it? Speaker. Bixby. Okay. What was it? Bixby. Bixby. Uh, okay, that's that's not the one I remember, but um, but I guess it's uh, with Cortana for for Windows. Uh, they all use deep learning, and uh, it's a relatively new technology. They used to use hidden Markov models and all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, but deep learning is kind of revolutionizing a lot of these perceptual tasks that human or that machines are doing. And the reason that it's working is because we have so much data. We have tons and tons of data of here's somebody saying something into a microphone and here's the transcription of what they said. 
And you can just feed that into a neural network and it'll train and it'll eventually figure out, if I hear this, this is what they said. Um, but uh, one of the problems with, you know, we can build a big deep learning network that rivals the human brain, but where's the data? You know, I, I need an example, you know, I need to like hook you up to some sort of a, you know, a, a brain scanner and I'm gonna scan all of the inputs that are coming in, you know, visual, audio, and I'm gonna collect those and then I'm gonna, you know, figure out what your brain is doing and what actions you take and then try to train this gigantic network on that. It's just not feasible right now. So, so that's you know, one of the weaknesses of deep learning is it does require a lot of data to train on to get good at whatever you want to do. So more into super intelligence or in AI, in, in academia, we usually call it artificial general intelligence. Um, you know, how are we going to achieve that if, you know, if we in fact want to? And so, you know, deep learning is a part, but and there are a lot of other ways to achieve intelligence. You know, there's a lot of uh, systems out there uh, that use, you know, kind of rule-based systems, uh, cognitive architectures that try to model the brain at a functional level. Um, you know, there's a lot of individual AI systems, like one for vision, one for speech, one for natural language. We have one that does reasoning, problem solving, uh, theorem improving. You name it, we've got a little AI tool that does it, and we may be able to integrate all those together and get something bigger as a result. Um, there's also a, a big uh, projects going on, one in Europe and one here in the US. Um, IBM is, is the one here that are really trying to you know, reverse engineer the brain and simulate it on a computer. And this isn't just um, you know, simple. They're they're actually you know down to the electrochemical models of neurons. You know, there's about I think 30, 40 different types of neurons in the brain, different types of synapses. Uh, of course, you know, based on what you ate for breakfast, your brain does something different than it does in the evening. So uh, they're trying to model all of that down to you know very precise copy of what goes on in the brain. And so so I feel that that's you know, in 10, 20 years, they've already, like I said, have a model of the uh, honeybee that does pretty well. It doesn't fly. <laughs> it just sits in a computer. But, uh, but I think that this is probably where the next breakthrough is going to come when they start figuring out how does the human brain learn, remember, make decisions, um, and then we can mimic those inside a computer. And lastly, of course, the biggest issue for AI coming up is we need more AI movies. Um, I haven't seen a good one for, well, I guess there were a couple early this year. Um, I'm hoping they'll make a sequel to the AI movie because I didn't really like that movie. Uh, but uh, we'll see. So that's my road to research. That's what I do research on. Hopefully a little bit of food for thought about um, you know, going forward, if you have any questions, here's my contact information, and that's all I have. Thank you for listening. Thank you.